Um, your time management one, has everyone submitted that? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Um, so we need to question on time management. Can you speak yeah. to yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Ah, uh, yes, you can. Uh, if there are like rooms, because I was like, say, lunch and gap, say, for like an hour and a half to study. I did, I just put like, it was how my day. Okay, it's, it's up to you. It's a tool to serve you. Okay, so if you find that that's good, that's helpful. If you find that you're, um, you're, you don't have time for lunch, you're skipping lunch, then I would say yes, make sure you put it in. Yeah. I think the biggest one is satisfactory. satisfactory or not yet. Satisfactory? Fantastic. Right, if I speak into this, just let me know that I need another coffee. I need to go here. Um, okay, so before we start, am I already on? Caroline, Matt, good to see you. Uh, we're just having a quick chat about the assessment, uh, the personal development one that will be marked by the end of the week, um, the first one, the personality test. And we're just having a chat about the time management one. Now, when it comes to time management, do we need to go into the detail of putting in breakfast, lunch, and meals? Uh, only if that serves you. Remember, this is a tool that is supposed to help you, that is supposed to serve you and to help you. And so if you find that that helps and that works for you, please do. If you find that that's uh, just annoying and overcomplicating it, then don't do it. Uh, it really is whatever works for you. Have you found that exercise to be helpful? Yeah. Yeah, it just makes you think through what your priorities are. Yeah. All right, so we are in, and am I still in view of the camera? <coughs> it's all right, I don't need to move or anything like that. Cool. Uh, so we are doing which topic? Crafting and rest. Crafting and rest, okay, what, what unit are we doing? Personal development, you're right, it was, that was the topic. Personal development, what is personal development all about? Christian disciplines. Building Christian disciplines, fantastic, well done. What are Christian disciplines? Uh, rules we have in place to discipline us in our godly lives. Rules we have in place to discipline us in our godly lives. Look, that's, there is some validity to that. Um, it's not the terminology that I would use because that tends to be like a, you know, uh, I know Dora when she was in Singapore, they had in their schools a someone that their job was called discipline master uh, to enforce discipline. Uh, and so that's the type of image that comes to our mind. Whereas we know that that's not actually who God is. And God does discipline those, um, those that he loves, but uh, in that context, I wouldn't probably would, uh, I'd use a different terminology. What are Christian disciplines? When you hear that word disciplines, is it supposed to be punishment that comes to mind or is there another another phrase? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Sean, did you have uh, a mind like a mindset? A mindset, yes. So yeah, you're right, guiding, steering. Okay, so things that draw us closer to God. Uh, yes, I, I would say you're getting quite on point. We were looking at a particular phrase. Jesus used this phrase when talking about 12 of his close friends that followed him and modeled their lives after him. Disciples, disciples. disciples. Okay, fantastic. Uh, is, and I am doing a bit of recap because I'm wanting to make sure that we stay on the same page that all these topics actually feel, uh, fit into a broader context. So when it comes to a disciple, is it better to be a Christian or a disciple? Which one is the one that we should be striving to achieve? Christian? Who works Christian? What about a Christian disciple? Who works disciple? Okay, true question. Uh, it is Christian disciple. So disciple, but let me explain. Now disciple is actually quite a broad term. To be a disciple means that you are positioning yourself as a student, as someone that's learning from someone else. It doesn't have to be in a Christian context. Okay, so I could be teaching you about accounting or auditing or uh, one of those other fantastic units I did in my commerce degree. And you would be, I would be discipling you to a degree. Uh, because as a student, you would be learning from uh, a teacher. All right, so that's the relationship. So the term disciple is actually quite a broad one term Christian is a very specific one. Christian being 
a follower of Christ. What does that word Christian actually mean? Little Christ, very good. Uh, little anointed one. It was used as a term of mockery, but now is a term, a badge of honor that we hold as the symbol or the label of our faith. Now, we went from there uh, in the very first topic. Remember, we covered two topics each week. Then we looked at the next one, which is you are spiritual. Broadly speaking, you're made up of three parts. What are those three parts? Yeah, body, soul, and spirit. Okay, your body, obviously your physical body, your um, uh, your soul, uh, your heart, your uh, your emotions, your will, your intellect, your reasoning ability, and finally your spirit. And that's where we're concentrating our effort on in this year, talking about what are the spiritual practices. Um, now, when we say Christian disciplines, what's the term, what's the definition that we're looking for when we hear that phrase, Christian disciplines? Which again comes back to our original question, but I'm going to ask, now that we understand about discipleship, Christian discipleship, being like Christ, get to define what is Christian disciplines, what's the purpose of them? Spiritual practices that position us in Christ. Spiritual practices that position us in Christ. So when we're talking about all these different topics, we've looked at the sacraments, and we looked at worship, we looked at gratitude, we looked at time management. Uh, we've got another 20 or so that we're going to touch on throughout this semester. And in your book, there are even more. Uh, but the whole heart behind this is that we learn spiritual practices that position us in a place that we are intimate with God, position us in the community of God, you know, the, remembering that we are created for community, and these practices, bar one or two that are very personal and individual, i.e. solitude, the majority of them are actually designed to be outworked. In the context of community, is just like this. But the heart, remember, is positioning us in Christ. All right, let's get into today's topic. Today, we're going to start with fasting. We're going to be covering fasting for the first part and resting for the second. So, I love this. Without a purpose and a plan, it's not Christian fasting. It's just going <coughs> hungry. Now, where does fasting fit in the context of Christian disciplines? Remembering that we are on a journey to become the person that God's created us to be. Everything we do is an expression of our spirituality. And Christian disciplines position us so that God can transform us. Let's have a look at Matthew 6, verse 16 to 18. Who's going to read that for me? You've got it on your PowerPoint if you want to cheat. Oh, when you fast, do not... Oh, hang on, hang on. Does it start with if you fast? When you fast. Okay, we're going to pause you there. I'm going to let you read in a minute. When it comes to fasting, it's not if you fast. These are the words of Jesus, by the way. These aren't, uh, you know, th these aren't just from the bibliography in the back of your Bible, not from the concordance. These are from the words of the Messiah himself. And he says, when you fast. You know that fasting is supposed to be part of the Christian life. Sean, I'll stop interrupting. I'll let you finish. No, no, no. It's your cousin. When you fast, do not look sober as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show others they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full, but when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Okay, so Jesus is passionate about fasting. He gives us instruction, uh, he commands it, he expects it of us, he wants us to fast. Now when it comes to fasting, there are two sort of extremes that people go to. Uh, firstly, we have, uh, and I think this quote from John Wesley really sums it up. Who knows who John Wesley is, by the way? Oh yeah, and, uh, no, he's, um, I just remember he's, he's written a lot of his songs. Yes. I, yeah, I'm sure he was. I, that's not how I know him, but that's also because I haven't done a whole lot of research on him. Yes. Yes. The reform, not the reformed. You were. You're on the right track. You're on the right track. It was a. 
you know, in many ways a reformation. <coughs> Who, what, what denomination did this man start? AOG, was it? No, it wasn't AOG, although the Pentecostal movement did come from this movement, a lot of people trace it back. John Wesley started the, for 100 points, he was on church, no, that was Brian Houston but look who we'll with it. He started uh, the Methodist movement. All right, so you can research that amazing uh, new move of God in its time. And he said this, some have exalted religious fasting beyond all scripture and reason and others have utterly disregarded it. Some people have such a high value for fasting that they say that this is the true measure of a Christian. It is better than reading the word. It is better than praying. It's better than solitude. It's better than time management. It's better than worship. This is the pinnacle of being a Christian disciple. One extreme. The other extreme is, I oh know fasting's not for me. I oh know, I, I look, I'm happy to go to church. I'm happy to, you know, to, to read the Bible every now and then. I'll, I'll get my app and I'll get my word of the day, which I'll read, you know, once a month. Uh, at, but, but definitely fasting, you know, don't, don't touch my food. Don't touch my food. And we've got these two extremes. Now, Jesus doesn't elevate fasting above all other spiritual practices, but nor does he disregard it and say it's irrelevant. He says, when you fast, he expects us to fast, but let's make sure that we keep it in the context of where it is. So, what is a fast? It is the self-denial of normal necessities uh, in order to intentionally attend to God in prayer. Bringing attachments and craving to the surface opens a place for prayer. This physical awareness of emptiness is the reminder to turn to Jesus who alone can satisfy. And fasting is a voluntary act of giving up something, mostly food or drink, to seek God in prayer. Fasting is sacrificing something so that we can gain something else. We're going to talk about what we gain in a couple of moments' time. Let's again have a look at the screen here. Why fast? What's the big deal about it? Well, firstly, we understand that Jesus modeled fasting. Uh, in Matthew 4, verse 1 to 4, what did Jesus do in that account? He went into the desert. Yes, he went into the desert for 30 days, right? 40 days. 40 days, yes, just making sure we wait. Last session of the day. But 40 days he went and he didn't eat, he didn't drink, he was tempted in the desert, he fasted and he prayed. <laughs> little, con little thing, I'm not going to go into great detail for the rest of it, but please understand that it's not just about fasting, it's when the practice of fasting and the practice of prayer are put together that we have great power, fasting and prayer together. Yeah. Yes, usually that's the way. Um, and, and yes, that would be the encouragement. Uh, it, it will make a little bit more sense when we have a look at, uh, at the, what we gain from fasting. All right, so Jesus modeled it. Jesus assumed his disciples would fast. We've already covered that when you, uh, when you fast. Jesus' disciples actually did fast. They didn't just hear the word, but they were blessed because they did the word. And in Acts 13 verse 2, as well as the other references, it specifically talks about when the disciples did fast. And it positions us in, to participate in Christ, to be transformed. It is a positioning, it's a spiritual practice that brings us closer to Christ. All right, what's the purpose of fasting? Broadly speaking, uh, awareness. All right, so Acts 13 verse 1 to 3 is an account about when the uh, the people of God fasted. And as they fasted, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. They laid a hand and they sent out. There is an awareness that takes place. All right, right now, I want you to close your eyes. Hands down, eyes closed, no one looking around. This is like youth group when we're trying to do a salvation old school, honestly. So many times, I spent like 15 minutes just trying to get the kids to close their eyes. Okay, you cannot see anything in this moment. <coughs> One of your senses has been taken out. Obviously, we're talking about your vision. What are you noticing about your hearing? Uh, the air comes on. The air comes loud, absolutely. And it's cold. <laughs> yes, okay, it's cold. Uh, mm -hmm. Using smell. Yeah. Keeping your eyes closed for a moment. We're going to really draw this one out. What's going on? Um, well, you're talking. Mm-hmm. 
as a usual. <laughs> Wait, so we just like silent, silent? No, no, just all I said is close your, close your eyes, you can talk. Sarah, you were saying? Okay, great, open your eyes. When you dull one set, your other one's working overdrive. It's a little bit uh -huh. like, have you ever... Um, uh, Driven a car with headphones on, okay, one example. Uh, I know when, um, one of the things I like to do when I go swimming is, uh, particularly as a kid, is go up to the little jets of water that come out, and when you block one, more water comes from the other jets. Has anyone done that in a pool or a spa? Yeah. That's what fasting actually does. It's a blocking, it's a sacrifice. It's putting a stop to one area of your life and concentrating or aligning or focusing your energy uh, on your other senses. And in particular, what we're trying to do with fasting is activate not our smell, not our taste, not our hearing, but our spiritual senses. All right, and that's what the, uh, the thing about fasting does. So number one is it creates awareness helps us to become aware of the Holy Spirit, aware of His voice. That directly leads to the next point, which is it creates intimacy. Now, Jesus and uh, John the Baptist's disciples were having a conversation one day. Uh, in fact, Jesus and, and John the Baptist's disciples were having a conversation and saying, hang on a minute, how come we have to fast? This is John the Baptist's disciples. How come we have to fast? And Jesus responds to them and says, hey, look, the time's coming when my boys are going to have to fast as well. But right now, they don't need to because the bridegroom is here. In other words, I'm here. There's no need to fast for intimacy because I'm right here. But the time will come when they will need to do just that. And that's what we see in the book of Acts. There are a number of times uh, that fasting takes place. And then again, Paul and the other uh, writers of the New Testament really specify that in their letters later on. Did they fast all that way? Did they fast? Uh, Great question. Uh, not sure. Check out, check out Acts chapter one, and um, if you can let me know next time, that'd be great. I'm not going to give you an answer that I'm not sure of, so but you do a bit of homework. Absolutely, after class. Okay, the last one is breakthrough. So Mark ten verse nine. He said to them, "This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting." What was the context? A evil spirit, very good. There was a little boy uh, who had an evil spirit that was at work and he was manifesting, he was on the ground um, and shrieking and screaming and, and it had been something that he'd had since he was a very young, uh, since he was a very young child. And so the disciples, they'd been sent out, 72 of them in 36 groups, went out in groups of two. And out they went all across the country uh, as directed by Jesus himself. And then they come back and they say, look, Jesus, you said that we're to go and preach the gospel. You said that we're to go and to uh, heal the sick, proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God and to cast out demons. But this one won't come out. What do we do? And Jesus responds as he is looking at them. Actually, what has happened is Jesus has cast out the demon. Uh, the boy has been set free. Life has come into him. And the disciples are having this conversation in their post, uh, in their debrief at the end of it. Hey, how come we couldn't get this demon out? What was going on? And Jesus says to them that this only comes out by prayer and fasting. The interesting thing is that Jesus, when he casts out the demon, neither prays nor fasts. Did you notice that? He just caught it out on the spot. But, but Jesus, okay, great question. He is Jesus, he is God. But Jesus chose when he was here on earth to put aside his divine uh, abilities and to take on the form of man. We know that Jesus did fast though. We looked at that a little bit earlier. Jesus spent 40 days in the desert tempted by the devil. He prayed and he fasted. I believe that as we pray and we fast that we actually build up our spiritual muscle, our spiritual credibility so that when we pray and uh, we declare things, when we drive out the demons, whether it be manifesting over a, an individual uh, or whether it be over a geographic area, that there is an authority, there is a power, there is some spiritual muscle that comes from having been in a place of breakthrough and prayer first and then seeing it come into reality. And fasting helps us with that. Why? Because it switches our awareness on. It focuses our energy onto our spiritual senses. So there's great power in fasting, great significance in it. 
Uh, I spoke to, we had the Supernatural course last night, and we were talking about deliverance, and uh, had some you know, juicy stories that people were sharing, and I was sharing as well, and you know, all good fun, certainly kept everyone awake and sharp and alert. Uh, but we were talking about how when it comes to the angelic or the demonic realm, remember that demons are fallen angels, but there is a hierarchy that we see at work. We see in the uh, angelic side, we see the archangel Gabriel, uh, and the fact that he is mentioned as an archangel means that there is a recognition of a hierarchy in the spirit. We know that the centurion, when he wanted to get his servant healed, he came to Jesus and said, look, my servant's unwell, can you come, uh, can, you, can you heal him? And Jesus said, yep, I'll make my way there after I finish ministering here. And the centurion said, no, 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 I understand authority. All you need to do is say the word and he will be healed. And he was healed in that moment. Jesus said, wow, I'm amazed by this man's faith. He said, I understand authority. There's an authority structure. And so when it comes to praying and fasting and seeing deliverance, seeing breakthrough, uh, there is something that is one in the spiritual ground through prayer and fasting. Not just fasting, not just prayer, but prayer and fasting together, concentration. So those are some of the purposes of fasting. Any questions so far? Great. What type of fast can we do? I want you to have a, uh, give me some thoughts. What are some of the fasts that we can do? Chocolate. Well, let's not start at the top level, hey? <laughs> chocolate, yes. So you can choose a specific type of food. Uh, so chocolate, um, coffee was hard. Facebook, okay, yes. Social media, contemporary fast. Is that real fasting, though? It was to me. It was. But Jesus never said fast Facebook. <laughs> Okay, so when we are engaged profusely on Facebook, it, um, it becomes an expression that becomes part of you know, who we are, how we express ourselves anyway. It doesn't sort of become who we are, it shouldn't anyway. If it does, then it becomes an idol, but it becomes a part of our lives. And so to cut that off and to concentrate that energy rather than on social media, but onto things of God through prayer, uh, it does sharpen our senses. Also, it's a great detox for the mind on a practical level. Uh, what are the other ways? What are the ways mentioned in the Bible? Yeah, yeah, okay, absolutely brilliant. Like I mentioned, the coffee is probably the hardest thing to fast for me at the moment. Meat? Yes, okay, so who was known to fast meat in the Bible? Daniel. Okay, so Daniel, that was not just a, like a three-day or a seven-day fast. This was a lifestyle. He said, I am going to abstain from eating, and his mates as well, going to abstain from eating, drinking wine, did you mention that, and eating meat. It was a fast. It was something that he did to set himself aside for the Lord. Right. So you would have heard the phrase Daniel fast, which is basically a vegetarian fast. That's the purpose of it. No refined stuff. Yep, absolutely. What are some other things? Paleo for a week. Hey? Paleo for a week. Paleo for a week. Yes, that would probably be more of a diet, but you know, if it works for you. What's my point? What's my point when it comes to fasting? Absolutely. How do you def how do you know what's a fast? I ask you ask God. It's true. Um, we we are spirit led people. I think the best way to do it is to actually pray and say, God, would you help me know what's a fast? If we're not sure, then choose something, find something, and start that process. <laughs> will help us to hear the voice of God anyway. Now, when it comes to hearing God's voice. I'm going a little bit off topic, but we will bring it in in a moment. There are four types of voices that we can hear. Four sources. What are those voices that we can hear in our head? Uh, our own. So we can hear self. God. Yes, God. So I'm going to call that spirit, because this is where they all start with S. Yeah, God's voice, our voice. The demonic or Satan's voice. Yes, absolutely. 
yeah, the world at large, society or static. It's just that you go, you know, you'll be driving back here. Uh, you might go to watch a movie uh, over the weekend or tonight. You will, ha or watch TV. By the time you've driven home, firstly, you've seen probably 50 different advertisements, then you'll switch on the TV and you will find you know, eight advertisements in every break between your commercial. On top of that is the messages are subtle and obvious that come through the media that you're actually watching. My point is that there's lots of other information that gets fed from outside. Fasting helps to concentrate your energy and your focus so that you can hear the voice of God. Awesome. All right. Anything else that you would like to know about fasting? Okay, let me. Yep. Uh, great question. Okay, this is where I was going to lead. Okay, so let's say we are talking about food. Okay, because Jesus fasted food and drink. Um, unless you, A, hear directly from God, I would recommend that you don't fast um, liquids completely. If you do decide that, then get accountable, make sure that people are speaking into your life, uh, get the advice of a medical practitioner, um, because sometimes, and when it comes to liquid, you're actually, your, your, your physical life is at stake there, so you don't want to mess around with that. You want to hear from God and you need other people to say, okay, you need to stop now, okay? But when it comes to food, uh, there are a couple of different ways that you can fast. Okay, like we said, we can take a little, you know, a meal here or there, or we can take a part of our diet out. Uh, but if you decide to fast for no food, my suggestion and a couple of practical things are these. Number one is that if you're going to say fast for um, seven days, that you build your way up there. Okay, so maybe start by fasting one meal. Uh, maybe one meal a week or maybe one meal every day for the next week and get used to that. And then maybe a couple of days and then build yourself up to that point that you can do a seven day fast if that's what you feel God's calling you to. All right, so you've got to be wise to steward this body that God has given you, okay? If you've got medical conditions, Chris, I wouldn't suggest. No, and, and I don't think God expects that of you. All right, so you need to look at what's your physical health like. You need to look at your lifestyle. An elite athlete such as myself, <laughs> that's my excuse for not doing a full fast, uh, but you know what I mean? Elite athletes, if that's their profession, they can't afford to fast uh, in that way. Remembering we're talking about developing spiritual, um, uh, a spiritual wise, uh, it's not about trying to replicate, uh, you know, what someone else might have done a 40 day fast. But work your way up there, build your way up there, and do it with accountability what God's called you to do. Now, is it okay to fast, say you're fasting food, and you become a bit of a grumpy bum because you're craving coffee, you're craving food, is that how we're supposed to fast? supposed to whinge and whine, oh my goodness, <laughs> life is so hard because I'm fasting, yeah, oil on the face, you suck it up, <laughs> put a smile on your face, and it's actually a personal thing, it's not about being public, now it's not also about pretending and saying, oh no, no, I'm fasting, I'm fasting, that's not what Jesus is talking about. What he's saying is don't make a show about it. Don't be showy about it. But talk to your family. Talk to people that are in your life. It's going to affect. You know, don't just come back. And if I just came back and said, oh, I'm not eating dinner tonight, Dora, and not tell her why. Uh, firstly, I should have given her the heads up because God is a God who knows things in advance. Uh, unless he's given me a on the spot, I want to start fasting immediately. Of course, we obey, but generally we've got a lead up time. But I need to talk to her and say, this is what I'm thinking. Um, and, and I'm wanting to do a fast, I'm looking at this time here, um, I'm going to make sure that I am extra deliberate to be loving uh, and to understand that I'm going to have a lack of energy but I'm going to need to work harder to make sure that I'm not letting that grumpy just through. Yep. Do you recommend a certain type of oil? Olive oil, lavender oil? Uh, whichever one's on offer at Coles in a given week is good. Uh, no, in all seriousness, I mean, I like to use olive oil. Uh, I don't actually put it on my face. <laughs> Let me give you some example. For anointing oil, I like to use olive oil because you know it's talked about in the Bible and it just helps me connect with you know the oil that 
was of the land of Israel. But you don't have to. Rice bran oil, canola oil, sunflower oil, anything you like does the same thing because it's the faith that we put behind it. Now let's talk about it when it comes to fasting. Now today we probably don't need to put oil on our face. I don't see any of the beauty companies advertising, you know, special types of oil that you can rub on your face and it looks all, yeah, wipe your face. Well, that's, I've never seen any of the, any of the models on the ads. All right, before you go out, okay. I am not here to lecture you on makeup or skincare, uh, but I am here to say, I am here to say that the point is not how you cover your face to make sure people don't see that you're fasting. The point is that you don't make a big show about it because it's about building your faith and your intimacy with Christ. All right, we're going to take a 30 second break, finishing with fasting, and then we're going to come back and we're going to rest. I can turn it off, yeah. Yeah, we'll turn it off, that'll be good. All right, resting up. Uh, so Stretch, stand to your feet. Lately? Lately, uh, yes. You um, decided that like most of your sermons and everything you say have to like either rhyme or be in some sort of alphabet. Like, yes, it helps me remember. It helps me remember without looking at my notes. Okay. We'll start with like these, like the room comes out Yes. Yeah. I know, I need a little, little <laughs> bit of time. Fine. So the first one was about what anointing service is all about. The second one was a couple of practicals. Yeah, this is how you approach it. I like, oh, probably need is there. Yeah. Clarify that a bit better. It's good. Yeah. If I'm doing it this week, I'll make sure I do it, but I'm not sure. PJ's going to cover it. Okay, stretch your hands. Stretch your legs. Pentecostal fingers. Spirit fingers. High five to the person next to you. High five, Jesus. Fantastic. Okay. Now. <laughs> Let's get into rest. This is a great topic. This is an important topic. This is one that we need to grab a hold of. This is one for you and me, particularly in the busyness of life. Rest. Let's have a look at the biblical context. Uh, we are going to read firstly from Exodus 20, verse 8 to 11. I'm going to ask Ange if you can read that. And Chris, if you can read Mark chapter 2, verse 28. Um, you can go to your Bible or it is in your notes, but it is quite small in your notes. Okay, who knows what the context of Exodus 20 is? What was God doing? This is the, these are the words of God. Yes, the Israelites had, I say, book of Exodus, the context of it firstly is that they've come out from slavery in Egypt and they are in the wilderness on the way to the promised land. What's God speaking about in this context? Exodus chapter 20. Very important part of scripture, very important part of Israel's legal system. God is starting to unpack the Ten Commandments, absolutely. Uh, one of the commandments that God himself <laughs> speaks to the people about is you need to have a Sabbath day, a day of rest. Now, this all originated right back when God created the world. Day one, he created. Day two, he created. He worked. Day three, he worked. Day four, he worked. Day five, they worked. Day six, he worked. Every day he said, it is good, it is good, it is good. And day seven, he, he rested. He took a break. God modeled it. God created it. In fact, uh, from, the, uh, from that book of Genesis, from that, that time, uh, our world has modeled its week on a seven day cycle. This is where it all originated from. Now, if you were to go to Israel, uh, like I let my wife do last year, um, she went and uh, everything was, uh, you know, amazing. She went and everything was open, except for, and tell me if I'm right here, Dora, are you listening or you got your headphones in? 
you yeah, listening? I believe that from sunset on a Friday till sunset on a Saturday, that a everything closed down. Is that correct? Except the Arabs. Okay, we're talking about the Jews. All right, so the people of God that follow everything, even today in Israel, shuts down effectively on Saturday. Now, they go to very great extremes to the point that I remember Dora coming back and saying that in the hotel, she went to go uh, to their floor and there was a lady, uh, a, a Jewish lady, that was in the lift with them. And uh, Dora and her um, other classmates and friends, they went to go to their level, but this lady, she didn't press any buttons on the elevator. And eventually they were kind of like, you know, what's going on? Is they on the same floor? But I'm pretty sure she's not on the same floor. And asked her, uh, is there any reason or something to the effect of, is there any reason why you haven't chosen where, which floor to go to? And it was only when they asked that she was allowed to say, I'm not allowed to press a button because it's a Sabbath day, Shabbat. Um, had to be someone else, and she wasn't even allowed to ask someone to press the button for her. Now, my point is that, all credit to them, they have taken this principle and put it into practice. I would suggest, though, that they have lost sight of the purpose. Now, Jesus said, and I will get to Chris if you can read this next part. Um, then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Fantastic. What was going? What was in the background here going on is that in Jesus' time there were Pharisees. Now Pharisees were well-intentioned people, sort of. They had very high regard for the law, very hard reg high regard for making sure that everyone kept the law perfectly or better. And when they saw this guy called Jesus, this rabbi that was getting an ever-increasing number of followers, they started to get a bit worried because he wasn't following things according to the way that they had interpreted the law. And one of the biggest things that you will find is that they complained that Jesus did things on Saturdays. Saturdays were supposed to be a day of rest. Saturdays was not a day to work. And where Jesus made this comment here, he and his friends, his, his disciples, they were walking through the fields of grain. And some of them, as they were walking, some had their hand out, and they'd be picking a little bit of the grain and, and eating it as they went along. Now, the Pharisees saw this and said, whoa, hang on, stop a minute. Stop a minute. Did you see that? Did you see that? They are taking the grain. They are picking it, and it's a Saturday. It is the Sabbath day. They're not allowed to be doing this. They are working. And Jesus comes back, rebukes them, uh, calls out all of their hypocrisy, and says, hang on a minute. You, you totally missed the point here. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The whole point of this day of rest, this holy day, was so that it would be a blessing and a resource to you, not a burden to you. Is this still on my head? No. Right? I think it's off, isn't it? Huh? It is? Oh, yeah. It's light. All right. That's cool. That's cool. As long as it's in the um, recording, that's fine. Hold it a little closer to me. Is that better? Yeah. Cool. Uh, Dr. Wayne Dyer, he makes this comment here. I am a human being, not a human doing. Okay, tape corny, but go with it. I'm a human being, not a human doing. Don't equate self-worth with how well you do the things in life. You aren't what you do. If you are what you do, then when you don't, you aren't. He makes a pretty good case. We are human beings. Our existence, our identity is not from what we do. And yet, if we have a conversation with someone, I know being on the guest lounge, we welcome people to church all the time. Hi, what's your name? And, and eating in class, but that's good. <laughs> Keeping yourself strong, refreshed, and rested. Um, and Chris, what do you do? Um, or uh, who Bible are you? College. Yeah, I'm a Bible college student. Yeah. Uh, we go to our profession. We go to what we do. But in reality, that's not the core of who we are. And so, when God instituted this whole concept of rest, not later on when He saw that the world was struggling right from the start and call it a holy day, a sacred day, dedicate this day, tithe this day if you like. 
What he was saying is, it is important that my people take time to rest. This is of value, this is of significance, this is because I love you. Entering into rest depends on honoring our God-given limits. By paying attention to the physical, mental, and spiritual needs of the body, we learn when and how to rest. You have limitations. I have limitations. There is a point when our energy runs out. Uh, Isaiah tells us that even youths, even young people, even athletes, grow tired and weary. There is a limitation to us. Physically, we recognize that there is a point that we need to rest. Emotionally, we also need rest. And spiritually, we absolutely need it as well. Why rest? Number one, God commands it. We read that just now in the uh, Exodus chapter 20, talking about the Ten Commandments. Jesus modeled it. Uh, we see that right throughout the Gospels, but uh, we notice that Jesus would take time. There would be crowds of people following him, demanding his attention, but he would take time to seek God. He would spend time in solitude, praying, meditating, resting his body, resting his soul, and connecting, refreshing, renewing his spirit. Right? So Jesus modeled it. He wasn't just telling us, he modeled it. Jesus taught it. Uh, we see that in Mark 6, verse 30 to 32. You can read that in your own time. And it is essential to survival. If you were to take rest out of the picture, physical rest, which is purely looking at it from a physical point of view, what would happen to your mind, to your brain? Okay. After a period of time of lack of sleep, your ability to reason, your ability to think, is equivalent to someone that is highly intoxicated. The longer that you leave it, the more insane your mind becomes, the less control you have over it. And it's actually used, sleep deprivation is used as a form of torture. And left for too long, it will actually physically kill you, a lack of sleep. Which is why I get so upset with the crickets at night, although I have let to sleep through them now after a long summer. But it physically is requirement for survival. Now when we look at refreshing the soul, and rest for the soul. Can I put the same thing to you that we actually need to refresh our soul because in terms of our emotions and our soul life, it will kill us if we don't. And of course, that will have an impact on our spiritual life. Now, when it comes to rest and work, I want you to have a look at this diagram up here. There is a time that we need to work and there is a time that we need to rest. We actually need each of those extremes. We need to be going between them. Uh, and keep that in mind as we look at the next slide. If we have all work and no rest, someone that prides themselves on being a workaholic, and you can tell that they pride themselves, I'm a hardworking person, I'm a workaholic. What has happened in that moment? Their work and their work ethic has become part of their identity. They have become a human doing, going back to our previous quote. It's not healthy. In fact, it's a form of idolatry. It is exalting work and performance in a place of higher value and <coughs> esteem than God Himself. God was not, He didn't give the 10 suggestions, the 10 requests, the 10 great ideas, the 10 thoughts that I had today. It was 10 commandments. These are 10 things I want you to live by. The Ten Commandments, they weren't designed as rules, as limitations. They were designed as landmarks. So on the journey of life that we stay on track with these landmarks ahead of us, it was actually using the imagery of a journey. And one of those key things was the Sabbath. So all work, no rest is idolatry. All rest and no work is laziness. And the Bible has plenty to speak about that, about oh, the laziness. Not impressed. Our God is not impressed with laziness. He, of course, wants us to work. Um, in a physical sense, we actually do need to be working. Now, of course, there are certain situations and certain seasons where we can't find work or we can't for various reasons. That's not obviously what I'm talking about. We remember that God is talking about the heart, right? It's not just purely looking at the outward. Uh, we know this because when David and his brothers lined up, 
everyone else was looking at the outward appearance of man. Like God spoke to the prophet Samuel and said, man looks for the outer appearance, but I look for the heart. So that applies into all of our Christian disciplines. Let's come back here. All rest, no work. Unemployment becomes a big issue. With unemployment comes a lack of the ability to live to a certain standard of living. Obviously, generally speaking. What do we need to strive for? A work-rest balance. Now, I would suggest to you that that doesn't mean working half-heartedly. But I would suggest that that looks like, when you go back and you have a look at your time management assessment and look at your calendar, that you've got times of work. Um, And study is your work. That is something that you're pouring yourself into, pouring the best of your energy, your talents, your time, your efforts, your intellect, pouring your best into. But it's equally important to have times of rest, times of refreshing, times of renewal. How do we do that? Uh, Well, let's firstly get a bit of a picture of what this life that we're supposed to live looks like. I love the message version of this, so I'm going to read it for us. And I want you to think about it. Let these words wash over you as I'm speaking them. Message version of Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Are you tired? Worn out? Burnt out of religion? Come to me, says Jesus. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I love that phrase. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. So how do we get those rhythms, those unforced rhythms of grace? Well, we can look at uh, the stresses of our life and we can start to identify the areas where we don't have those unforced rhythms of grace in place. In fact, when we live with a constant state of stress, it becomes a disorder that's a physical toll on us. Uh, If we live in a place of stress, what happens in stress is, uh, and our bodies are designed for this, there are moments that we are supposed to experience stress. Hormones are released into our bodies Our heart rate is elevated, our awareness and our alertness is sharpened, and we have a surge of energy, and we're supposed to be able to respond to difficult situations, fearful situations, or situations that require us to be alert and sharp. There's a time and a place for stress, don't get me wrong. But if that's our constant state of living, we actually expose ourselves to heart disease, we expose ourselves to a whole lot of stress disorders, Physically, imagine, uh, I don't know if you ever uh, had this, I certainly did, uh, where in high school when we had to give public presentations, class presentations, now I wasn't always uh, confident with the speaking and uh, definitely not wanting to get up in front or draw attention to myself. And physically, I would feel sick in my stomach. Now, anyone else relate to that? Yeah. Or a situation like that? No, you're good? Ever been time that you're nervous going into an exam and you felt that physical light, it's like a knot in your stomach, felt sick? Okay. Yeah, I'm crash. Imagine if that is your constant state of living. Mm-hmm. It has an effect on your body. It affects your uh, nervous system, it affects your muscles, causes you to be tense inside, causes heart disease, if that's our long term. My um, grandfather spent three years in a concentration camp. My grandmother, this is in World War II, my grandmother was uh, bombed in, in the London bombings and uh, everyone in the car bar who died, she had horrific <coughs> injuries throughout her body. Both of them lived with post-traumatic stress disorder for the rest of their lives. Their bodies were in a state of stress. Now, my grandmother had a bit of time to work through that and did recover relatively well psychologically, but my grandfather not so would need to speak about that period of time. It had a physical toll on him, it had an emotional toll on him. It's not living with those unforced rhythms of grace. We need the healing power of God. Now, let's switch it. If we can learn to do what? In partnership with Jesus. Uh, the, the NIV version or other versions talk about not to be, uh, that my burden is light, my yoke is easy. Everyone heard that before? Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. It's talking about the imagery that comes to mind is that of an ox. And they would, in agricultural times, uh, which certainly is when the Bible was written, they would get two oxen together 
and they would be yoked together with wood that goes across them and there would be sort of a plow that goes down the middle of them and as they walk down the field this plow would pull up the, um, the ground so that the seed could be sown or the, um, the old wheat could be harvested and etc etc now the picture that was supposed to take place was that we understand that there is a moving together in partnership step by step learning the unforced rhythms of grace working together not that Knox really has a unforced rhythm of grace it's not really the phrase that would come to my mind but it's adequate and it's appropriate that's how we're supposed to live unforced rhythms of grace would go now for the last part I want you to do a little bit of a little bit of self-reflection I want you to think about the daily weekly monthly and annual things that you do to learn those unfor- unforced rhythms of grace. What do you do to apply these principles of rest? How do you apply the Sabbath, whether it be a full day off, whether it be in part, in portion? How do you apply God's principle of the Sabbath into your life? So write down those words, daily, weekly, monthly, annually. You might even write it down like this. Today, this week, this month, this year, what are you going to do to refresh yourself to keep yourself in a place of rest? Uh, don't, I would encourage you actually to go home and to flesh that out, but just come up with one thing. One thing for each. Yeah, just put one, just drop one, one thing next to it. What's one thing that you're doing today, or you've done today, to refresh yourself? What's one thing that you're going to do this week to refresh yourself? What does refresh you? Don't it be different for each person? Some people get refreshed uh, in amongst a big party, lots of people on it. Some people get refreshed by solitude, just taking some time out. Um, You can't put TV on there, by the way. PlayStation. Mm, all right. Remember PlayStation. You're engaging a bit more through that than TV. Yeah, I can no, do that. I did. I did. All right. All right. I thought about it. I what are those worried. things that refresh you emotionally, that fill up your tank? Afterwards, you feel like, oh, I can do that. Jazz music. Yeah. So refreshing. Right? Have you written any of these down, Sean, or are we just... Um, no, I did. Okay, yeah, good, you know, I'm just going to refresh. You know, I love how Carolyn and Matt have really taken today's lecture on. And to help them rest, they haven't even turned up for class today. Don't feel bad, guys. Uh, but uh, just see if they're actually listening to the end. We should test them. If you are listening to the end, send me an SMS. I'm going to test you over the next week or two to see if you actually got to the end of this. <laughs> If you actually watch it, you tell if you actually watch it, we say apples at the end. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, whatever, whatever. Okay. We say at the end. Okay. They say apples, they watched it. They did it. Okay, I uh, hopefully you've been able to come up with some things. I would encourage you to actually take some time to flesh it out a little bit more. The last thing we're going to end with on this topic is this one practice that you need that refreshes your spirit, that refreshes your soul. That refreshes your body and you need it daily. What would it be? Food. Food, okay, yes. Oh, yes. Spiritual food. Spiritual food, yes. Mm. Holy Spirit. Water. Water, food, yeah, yeah, they good. But what are these things? Rest. Think in the context of rest. Jesus. Sleep. Sleep. Yes, very good. All right, sleep. Sleep is important, okay? Now I'm talking to you in the final couple of minutes to, uh, of today about the importance of sleep. You are future ministers as far as I can uh, see, and that's what, I'm, that's what I'm speaking to. And there are times that it's going to be very difficult to get lots of sleep. Now there are seasons that you won't get it. You have a young bud, uh, just forget today's session on rest and pull it out in 12 months' time when the bub's a little bit older and sleeping through. But at a certain point that you actually get physical sleep. In our physical sleep, we have dreams. 
And those dreams can be of a prophetic nature. We actually need to be unconscious and well rested for that. But physically we need it too. Uh, most recommend seven to nine hours of sleep a night. Really important that we actually guard that and treasure that. As Bible college students, make sure you're getting your sleep. Yeah. Plan your assignments so that you do not have those all-nighters because you get to the morning and you will struggle with concentration and mood for the rest of the day. Get yourself some rest. It does refresh your body and soul and spirit. All right, I've covered everything on rest, everything on fasting that I can think of. Are there any questions? So what do you do daily week to work in your Me? Yeah. Okay, my daily is I am enjoying waking up early after getting at least seven hours of sleep a night uh, and going for a jog. It refreshes me, it gives me energy. Uh, I put my headphones on and it just gets me to focus on the day. Yeah, this is you. Um, you also I'm going free when I'm doing my jobs at 5.50 in the morning. Um, so that's my, my daily one. A weekly one is that uh, I have Saturdays off with family. Um, and on Mondays, Dora and I, because the kids are in school, we go for coffee yeah. and have a great time there, yeah. do a bit of shopping. I, like to, I do like to sit back and watch some TV.